I'm going to go ahead and let my wife open us up with prayer. Dear Jesus, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you that we have the freedom to talk about you openly, that we have access to your word, that we can pursue your heart as a collective group and talk about your goodness and your faithfulness. Would you just get every ounce of glory in this time together this morning? Would you pierce the hearts of the people here and those watching online to say what you're saying, not what we're saying, but what you're saying? Yeah, we just honor you. And we love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. So this morning, um, Pastor David asked us to speak last week. And uh, we actually had a sick two-year-old at home, and I wasn't sure this was going to happen. So she kind of took a turn last night and has been doing better and is fever-free. Um, and here we are. So uh, we're, we're excited to do this. Thank you, thank you Nana, for yes. coming over and taking you, care Nana of Thank you, Nana and Brookie, yeah, <laughs> um, for watching him at home. But what we wanted to share this morning, what we felt like the Lord put on our heart, was just to talk about kind of where we are. We've shared our testimony in parts. Um, over the last eight years of being here, we've been married for nine this year. So we came in as six month newlyweds. So most of the church has kind of seen a lot of this, um, but there's some new faces and we just kind of wanted to introduce ourselves and what we do here and share you, you know, share with you about the last six months and some nuggets from our history together. So I am the women's director as of September, um, I took on that volunteer role when I was like 20, 29 weeks pregnant with our seventh baby. So um, if that's not crazy, I don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> yes, you have my yes. Are you sure? Yes. Um, so uh, we actually were, were a blended family. We had, I had three boys when we got married, and he had two girls. They were two, three, four, five, and seven. And then we signed up to start over <laughs> two years ago. So we have a little two-year-old and an eight-month-old named Olive. And so, yes, they're very cute. I just don't have time to share them with people. <laughs> like I'm like, I haven't been on Facebook in months. Um, but yeah, so uh, that's kind of a, a, some of our lives. And then also Jeff, this is my husband, came on as the executive pastor in January. So we are now in ministry, both of us to some capacity, um, part-time and full-time. And we just kind of want to share about what that's been like and what God is saying in this season, because it speaks, I think what he's saying to us speaks to the body. So we just kind of want to share that with you. But um, the message of our, of our marriage and kind of a theme of our lives is that we have taken huge risk with God. And I want to, I want to clarify that because it's not a risk for the sake of being like an adrenaline junkie. And it's not a risk that says, oh, this is fun. It makes me feel alive. It's like, that makes me nauseous. Like, to do what we feel God calling us to do is like jumping out of an airplane and not knowing when the parachute will open. We believe that it will, but right now it feels like we've jumped and we're still waiting, right? But I really think that the walk with the Lord feels like that or should feel like that to most of us. Your dreams should scare you. You should know that like, if he doesn't show up, I'm not gonna make it kind of faith because that's the history of the faith heroes in the Bible. And their words, that cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12 is not about just them seeing us on that side of heaven. It's about what they're saying. It's about their lives. Like the blood of Abel still speaks right? Like the testimony of the God who parts the Red Sea is still parting Red Seas for us, right? So it's that. It's really looking at our lives through the lens of scripture and what he said and what he's saying and pressing in for that. And so we've taken high risk with the Lord, but I want to make it clear that our high risk up until this point have shown high reward, so because we trust him, it says in the Bible that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if you're not having to believe him for something, if it doesn't make you feel uncomfortable, Samira, 
my girl over here. She sends me songs and I love it. She said, it's like, it's like my love language with her. She'll send me a song and then I'll send her some. And I was at the gym the other day and there was a lyric of a song that said, it said, what's more dangerous, the persecuted or the comfortable? So like, we may not be persecuted. We may be just too comfortable and still not doing what God's called us to do. So I would hope that the testimony of what we share today in our lives is that we've taken high risk, but we took them with God. We took them with his direction. We took them in lordship. We took them from hearing his word for our life, for ourselves. Then it being confirmed by a body, confirmed by friends, confirmed by prophets, confirmed by leaders, but we heard from him in the secret place behind the veil. And confirmed by scripture. Right, right. So everything that he's spoken to us, we can find a, a precedent for in the word to go, yep, that's his nature. Yep, he did that with Elijah. He did that with Ezekiel. He did that with Moses. And then to take off this thing about like, well, those are just people in the Bible. Like, no, they're men and women of faith. They weren't superhuman. They had flaws. They manifested. They were scared, right? Being brave doesn't mean that you don't, you're never scared. It means you do it anyway, right? And so realizing that, taking off that like, the pedestal that we put people on, even now, maybe it's not the greats of the Old Testament. It's people in leadership where we think, well, it must be easy for them. Like, no, it's not easy. Like, <laughs> testify, babe. I'm like manifesting all over the place. I'm like, oh my gosh, what have we done? You know, like most of the time, it's a, it's a wrestling match with the Lord. It's so hard. Gosh. And the, and the whole time, I'm, I'm just correcting her with scripture and I'm like, and she's like, why do you have to be so mean? He's like, well, you're just in fear. Well, you're na, 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 na. I'm like, okay, that's not what you're here for. No, but you know, so many, so many years of driving to work, sc screaming out, God, write my name in Hebrews 11. You got to understand it, it comes with a price. And the people in Hebrews 11, it wasn't a cakewalk for any of them. So you have to know if you want, if you want that you have to know what you have to expect in the day. I may get ahead here, but the day that I told Pastor David I'm taking the job, he said, "All right, bro, be ready. Everything from here on out has to be spirit led." He said, "It's it it's gonna it, things are gonna be different now, and so here we are. It's different." Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, it really has stretched us to have big faith in God. And when we can't see it or when we, sometimes we've, we've really stepped out in faith and we know that we are obeying, but it doesn't look like we thought it would, right? Like you, many of you have been here, you've seen us receive prophetic words about stepping into ministry. My first night here, Kevin was like, exonerate the crowd and speak. And I was like, that felt amazing. I could do that for the rest of my life. Like I know it's what he called me to. And yet it doesn't feel like I thought it would in some ways. And it's come at such a price, right? And so um, it really has allowed us and challenged us to cling to hope. So our message this morning is called Heavenly Hope. Because when you don't see it, and you're even struggling to have faith for something, it's hard to have faith when you don't see it, when you can't even see that it's possible. So you just have to cling to hope in that verse that's, um, where it says faith is the substance of the things hoped for. So the hope comes first. You have to go, oh, I, I hope I could be better one day. I was chronically sick for three and a half years. So I would go, I, I came to a point where I couldn't see myself well, actually. I had just kind of like at 31 years old, I would forecast the rest of my years and think, I wonder where this sickness will be at 35. I wonder where it'll be at 40. Like I probably won't be able to do that. I probably won't, I began to think sick and it was one of the most toxic, cancerous ways to think because I couldn't even see myself well anymore. I didn't have hope to be healed. So how could I have faith to be healed when faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence, the proof, the hard proof of what I can't see, right? So really our testimony is that in waves. It's we took some giant risk. And then we clung to faith. And when we didn't see it, we had hope that he is 
who he said he is. Without faith, it is impossible to believe God for those who believe have to know that he is who he said he is. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, right? So high risk, high reward, and risking things under the lordship of Christ. I, I told her last night, I'm going to let you talk and I'll just tell jokes every once in a while. So. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, no, it's... Our story is pretty amazing, to be honest with you. And anytime you come up against something that seems impossible, you have to go back to what you thought was impossible and how the Lord moved. And for us, there's so many of those. Um, you know, you can call it an anchor, you could call it a stake in the ground, a line in the sand, but you know that you know that back then the Lord took care of it. And, um, you can't have faith and hope and and forget all that he's done. You have to you have to make sure you remember what he's done, right? And then you have to also focus on the prophetic words that you've been given in your life. So we've made a commitment to search out God's heart in a matter. If you're wondering, like, I have a decision in front of me, or I feel like I'm in a holding pattern, or I don't know what to do next, right? There's something to searching his heart. And what does that mean? It means the Bible says that it's the glory of a king to conceal a matter and it's the glory of men to search it out, Proverbs 25. So that means he's not hiding it from you, he's hiding it for you. And he wants you to seek him, right? There is beauty and there is grace to, to hear the voice of the Lord through another person, right? And to see that you're seen and to know that you're seen and that, and that the God of the universe would speak on your behalf, right? But it's different when it comes from him. See, because he can tell you difficult things to hear. When I hear from someone and they're like, the Lord told me, the Lord told me, the Lord told me, and nothing was hard to hear, I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. Because like when the Lord speaks to me, I'm like, oh, what? That is like, Rip, you know, ripping my heart out right now. Like that's hard to hear, but he does it with such love that you're like, discipline me, correct me. Cause you're doing it so that I'm healthy. You're doing it to root out the cancer that's killing me. You're doing it to root out an ungodly belief where I don't really trust you the way that I say I do, or I thought I did. He brings things to the surface not to shame you. He brings them because he's bringing the impurities because he cares about who you'll be for all of eternity. This life is not the end. It's about who we will become. It's all about who we will become. And he can use everything. He's not the author of everything, but he will use anything and everything. And you can choose to look at your life through the lens of his good love as a good father and say, that was designed to kill me. That was designed to derail me. That was designed to cause me to lose my mind, but here I stand with the sound mind of Christ. Here I stand with identity in the one who gave it all. He took the cross so that I could be free from that thing. He actually took the cross before you ever had that thing happen. So therefore, it's enough. It's enough so that he gets the glory in my story, in my testimony. And I say, yeah, that thing happened. And I didn't know if I was going to live through it, but here I am. And so much of our life has been that. It's like, oh my gosh, this feels terrifying. Oh my gosh, this is scary. We, got, we went on our first date, actually, which was a risk, <laughs> after two really hard 10-year marriages. And we had five children come into the table. So it was like, you know, it's heavy. Like, I got kids and you have kids. I heard something yesterday that said, going on a first date with a single mom is more like a job interview, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I had told the Lord, like, it's, I didn't do it. Like, there was like an eight-month period where I was really rebellious. So by the time I met him, I was ready to be like, uh-uh, not, uh, not today, Satan. I'm, it's me and you. And then the Lord, if y'all know the story, it's sweet. His mother came through the drive through I was working at Starbucks on my summer off as a teacher. I wasn't working. I had three small children. And so I got my, my college job back and she came through and um, there's something to that conversation because she said to me, you know, she found out my whole life story in like 
seven minutes. We were waiting for her spinach wrap to heat. So I was just popping out the window like, hey, how are you doing? Where are you going? What are the, you know? And so she was like, um, gosh, you know, so you're a teacher and, you know, you have three children and all the things. And she said, and you're newly divorced, but you still have your smile. And I said, well, I have this verse that I cling to, and it's Jeremiah 29, 11, And it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future. And she goes, oh my gosh, I just sent that verse to my son in the drive-thru. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. And she goes, and I can't help but think of him for you. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> get out of here. So she was like, no, he's handsome. And I said, everybody, every mama thinks her son is handsome. So she's like, no, he is. And he has two small girls and blah, blah, blah. And so she was like, okay, well, you know, what's your name? And I said, Lacey. And so she left and... And then she called me at work and um, she said, I just met the sweetest, most beautiful girl ever. And I had told her before when I was single and had gone through the d divorce, I said, I don't want to date anyone unless you see that she's the sweetest, most beautiful girl ever. So she calls me at work and she says, um, you really need to go to Starbucks and meet her. <laughs> and um, I was like, mom, I'm really busy. I can't right now. And um, so she said, okay, well, I think you need to figure it out. So I did, I, I, I did the next best thing. I went to Facebook and I typed in her name and there was a, 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 a contact, a mutual contact. I think it was, it was uh, Sherry Fields King. Um, are you in here, Sherry Fields King? Uh, I know she goes here sometimes. Uh, but anyways, so her name pops up, first one on the list, and I click the picture, and I'm like, I'm going to Starbucks. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I drove over there, and um, this was obviously before coffee waves, and, you know, it was, this was a long time ago. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I still have a special place in my heart for Starbucks. I'm not going to lie. I prefer Coffee Waves coffee, but Starbucks has, you know. Anyways, I go there. She's busy working. I don't get to talk to her because she's in and out and doing things. And so I went and got in the car, called my mom and said I couldn't talk to her. She was busy. And my mom's like, no, we're not giving up. <laughs> so... And my mom gets a hold of her on Facebook and asks if it's okay if I message her, and she says yes. So then I message her, and then we end up texting, and then... We had our first date the next day. So that was risky, but we did. And then we got married, shy of knowing each other five months, which is also not what I would recommend. However, uh, um, YPL, <laughs> YPL, young people, do that. Don't do that. Please. Yeah. <laughs> for yeah. us, honestly, though, it was crazy. It was like we were waiting for everyone to catch up because the Lord was so in it and he would begin to speak to me and speak to him. He began to heal my heart from the trauma of 10 years. I, I had been married from seven, almost, well, 18, newly 18 to 27. So it was like, 10 years of my first marriage, and he would begin to speak tenderly to me about what he had for me through Jeff. And the reason I knew that it was the Lord is because I could feel the tangible love of Jesus come through him. It wasn't like a lustful thing. It wasn't like an infatuation thing. I had never experienced anything like it. Like being in his presence brought me closer to the presence of God. And so it was different. It was also different because we began to reach out to our family who had been through the trauma of 10 years, right? They had been through a decade of when we didn't do it God's way and, and just the collateral damage of that. And so it, there needed to be a lot of confirmation, like our kids needed to be okay. My parents needed to be okay. His parents, his family, because you know they went through that with us, right? And so confirmation after confirmation, we sat down before... Um, our, you know, obviously we had the confirmation of Jeremiah 29, 11 in the Starbucks drive through but then we would go to Wichita Falls and we would meet with my grandparents and my granddad who loved the Lord. Every time he spoke about him, his voice would quiver. Tall, six foot two, cowboy looking dude. But then when he would speak about the Lord, he was so tender and he would say, 
all I keep hearing is Jeremiah 29, 11. And my mother would say that. And my aunt would say that. And this verse just followed us. And so we saw the goodness and mercy of God in this beautiful second chance. And I'm actually so thankful that we didn't listen to the world around us and that we went by the wise counsel of our family and church and spiritual mothers and fathers and the God within us, because if we would have waited eight months, my mother would not have been in attendance at our wedding. She would pass away before our one year anniversary. And so really the message of our story is like, take risk, but take it with the Lord. And know how to hear his voice. And if you don't, get into the word. Because there's nothing quite like hearing a, hearing a voice, hearing a statement, hearing a phrase, and going, I know that that's God. Because it lines up with his nature that I've read about. I know how to hear the voice of my good shepherd stewarding and guiding me. Yes, I make my plans. But he directs my steps because I know how to hear him. And it lines up with scripture. And if it doesn't, Get help because it's, he's not going to speak against something that's in his word. I heard someone say yesterday that God's ever evolving. No, he's not. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's actually the only constant thing that we have. Look around you. Nothing is secure. Nothing is constant. We can try to live lives with minimal risk, but even that is risky because I don't want to stand before a good father who says, I called you to more, but you couldn't have faith for it. You didn't live the life that I called you to live. You didn't have the children. I remember when, when God spoke to Jeff about having olives, she's our seventh, guys. Seven children. <laughs> we were pretty crazy. We felt for like for signing up for six. We had had five for six years. The Lord spoke to me in a dream about having a baby girl. He actually spoke it to me years prior, and I thought it was figurative, like I got two girls through marriage. And then I had the dream again in 2015. And I was like, oh, it was a little girl. She's blonde. She's calling me mama. I know that it's the Lord. And I woke up and the Lord said, Lacey, it was literal, not figurative. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> he had had a vasectomy in his first marriage 10 years prior. So that complicates things. Also, he had testicular cancer our first year married. So to reverse it after cancer. I had cancer for like three days. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we don't, yeah. And then it was gone, so. <laughs> Levi kicked him on the trampoline. Had surgery, but it was gone. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're like, oh, that season where you had cancer from like Monday to Thursday. Um. <laughs> it actually was found because one of my kids snap kicked me on the trampoline in the wrong spot. And that's how we found it. And he thinks he caused it to, still to this day. He's like, oh, he says, remember when I saved your life? Yeah. <laughs> He says, no, I'm sorry. He doesn't think he caused it. He thinks he's the one who discovered it. Yeah. So, but that whole thing was a whole nother, right? Big faith walk because he's very frugal. Like, it's good that he's your executive pastor because he's like, we don't need that. Don't spend that money. Da, 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 right? Like, he's going to take care of the money. But he was like, we're not paying $3,000 for that. And I was like, well, we get a discount because you're only reversing one side, you know? <laughs> Then he was all ears. He was all about that. So then, you know, we got to like go to the doctor in New Bronzeville. <laughs> no, honestly, the, the, the whole thing leading up to that was pretty miraculous. She had brought it up for years and years and years. And I would say, no, I don't, I just don't feel the Lord. But I had, what I had to come to the realization was I had made ministry an idol in my life because I knew I, I thought I knew that if we did this, it, would, it, it would, wouldn't allow us to step into ministry in the future because we'd be so busy with these kids and it would be a distraction and all the things. And so I just kept saying no. And um, she let it go for about a year or two and then had a convo with one of her girlfriends and she was like, girl, if it's a dream in your heart, you need to tell them. And um, she told me and I was like, fully manifesting. We were laying in bed and she told me and I just started yelling. And then immediately the Lord was just like, seriously, man? I was like, oh, I knew the reason I'm responding this way is because it's what you're saying for me to do and my flesh is opposing it. So I just said, you're right, babe, let's do this. So we scheduled this thing and went to New Braunfels and um, the doctor uh, the surgeon actually was a believer and we got in a circle, held hands and prayed. And he just said, God, we give, um, control. 
the control of life back to you. And they walked us through how it was pretty impossible, right? They're like, the tubing that we need to reconnect is the size of the O in God we trust on a penny. We need that to not get damaged or have scar tissue. And then they looked at me and they said, I I had chronic sickness for three and a half years with an autoimmune disease and it was very difficult, had to radiate my thyroid and that controls your hormones. So they walked us through that. We don't even know if you'll be able to get pregnant like you did before because your hormones are now controlled by a pill and all the things. And so we were like, well, we're just gonna trust God. We're not going to say, if God wanted to do it, I'll be the next like immaculate conception. Like we're going to take a step of faith, but then we're going to leave the result and the outcome in his hands. And so for years I said, Lord, if you want to reverse it, just do it supernaturally. But he, he didn't. Yeah, he didn't. So then that, that was a huge part of our walk though, because, um, you know, I had to trust the Lord with potential disappointment or make, you know, taking this step and not knowing how, how, how it would, you know, come out or how it would turn out. Um, that was also the summer that I quit my job as a full-time high school English teacher in the public school system. I taught for 13 years high school literature, 10th and 12th grade. I loved doing that. It was a grieving process to even leave. Um, but again, I heard the Lord speak. And I heard the Lord speak to me up here in worship. I had really wrestled with it all that whole school year. I felt kind of grace lifting from doing it. And I was confused because I thought I would do it forever. Let me say this. We don't do anything apart from each other. So if she hears something from the Lord, she tells me and I wait till I hear. And so this decision that she's talking about was not just her. It was both of us asking the Lord what to do. And we're not going to do anything apart from each other. Right. So I'm up here in worship and I, I'm just really wrestling because I got to tell my principal, like I got to tell him I quit and I'm re- resigning or I'm on for another year. And I heard the Lord say to me, Lacey, you can keep teaching. And where I had had all this like wrestling of like, how are we going to let go of that income? You know, my teacher salary, <laughs> how are we going to live? Um, <laughs> it was a big, it was a big faith step back then. Bling, bling, yeah. bling. Listen, anyway, so I really wrestled and I heard the Lord say that. And I thought, I felt the disappointment like, oh, I'll just keep teaching. Right. And then I heard him say, but if you'll trust me. And then I just burst into tears because I wanted what was on whatever was on the other side of that trust. And so I. I said yes in my spirit, and I thought it would be replaced with something right away, and it wasn't. I didn't do ministry. I didn't step into a new job or take a new role. I actually just sat with the Lord for two years at home without even permission to share what he was showing me. Like, I wouldn't want to post it. I'm a teacher. I'd want to post it. Oh, this revelation. I got this word. Let me tell you, this is what the Lord said. And he would, I would just feel this sense of like, no, no, this is for you. This is me and you. This is me and you. And I would think, but I'm so full, like I'm going to burst or lose it or forget it. And he would say, don't you know, I'm the one that brings back to your remembrance when you need it. You plan it. You be faithful to plan it. If you're in a season where you're bored or you have a lot of free time, do not squander it. I would do anything to have an hour with the Lord today. I'm like, Jesus, like, like on the toilet, like a trip to Walmart is like a vacation. I'm like, oh, if you see me on the floor at Hobby Lobby, just mind your business. Just keep on walking. I'm just trying to pick out some buttons. Okay. Just let me pick out which buttons I want. Like it's a different season now. I would do anything. Some of you college kids that are tired. What? Why are you tired? What are you doing that makes you tired? I don't understand. We had seven children, y'all. Seven. So I'm just kidding. All in, all in good fun. Okay. Everyone has trials in their own season. I know. But the point is, is like, he's now bringing back to my remembrance what was sown in the secret place through lordship with him. And I'm so thankful for that time because it wasn't lost. He now brings it back when I need it. And that's a principle of our lives as well, that you cannot ask the Lord to speak to you when you haven't sown his word. Because the Holy Spirit's job is to teach, it is to show, but he reveals through the pursuit. So if you, if you ask, the door will be opened. Seek, knock, 
ask, pursue him. I grew up in a Baptist church. I love my Baptist upbringing because I really understood the gospel, evangelism, discipleship, some really great things. But no one really taught me this. It came from the Holy Spirit showing me things as I, regardless of the denomination, right? It's from the pursuit of your heart. And so all of these seasons, you know, we've learned to like hear his voice and press in for that and then ask for confirmation from wise counsel. Um, There is wisdom, right, available through wise counsel and it can confirm what the Lord is saying. But if you hear our story, please hear us say that we seek the face of the Lord ourselves because that's the only thing that will sustain you, right? Sometimes people misstep, they misspeak. It was well-intentioned, it was close, but here's the thing. You can take any Bible verse and take it out of context and abuse it. Like people that come against the gospel or come against the word, they say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. No, it doesn't. It's speaking to a certain moment in a certain time. There's no formula, right? So if you, how many of you know um, Ecclesiastes? It's all about there's a season for everything, right? So there's a season to grieve. There's a season to mourn. There's a season to rejoice. There's a season to be born and to die, all the things. But here's the thing. In the word it says in Exodus 14, be still. And today you shall see the salvation of the Lord. But in 1 Timothy 1.18, it says war with your prophecies and fight the good fight. So what are we doing? Are we standing still? You got people standing still and they have a battle and they're losing it because they're not fighting. And you have a people, people warring and battling and fighting and calling down. Da, 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 and they're like militant walking around their house and they're supposed to be still. And watch the, the Lord work because it's not going to come in their own power. See, when I was sick for three and a half years, I kept trying to like earn my healing and declare the word and watch the sermon and do the things. And for some people, they've received healing that way. But there was a, there was a point where it got to, okay, I put the word in, I prayed the prayers, and now I trust. And I let the compassion of the Lord wash over me and heal my body. And so it's important that as we're walking with him, that we're saying, what are you saying right now? Which word applies to my life? Not any word, which word? Yeah. So as you, just to add to that, if you have, if you enter into a situation where you're in crisis or you have a thought or you have this or that, if your first response is, Ooh, I need to call the pastor to ask him, or I need to call my mom to ask her, or I need to call my friend or the most spiritual person I know to ask them, then you're still carnally minded. I'm, I'm sorry to say it, but you're still carnally minded. And so the way you get out of that is to renew your mind through reading your Bible, through spending time with the Lord. And so when those situations arise, your first response, and I'm not perfect, I'm not perfect at this, I promise you, we're all in process of this very thing, is the first thing, your natural response should be, Lord, what are you saying? Lord, what is this? What is happening? What do I do here? Who should I seek counsel with? If I, if I need to, who should that be? It, it, it has to be first him, and then you submit the prayer request, and then you meet with the people and you get wise counsel, but let him be the first response. Yeah, because that's going to be what sustains you. It's going to be when the Lord said something to you and you heard his voice. I, I have had moments where I encounter the word of God for my life, the right now rhema word, and I don't hear anything else like that for a year. Because when he speaks, there's weight And it has carried me. The last major encounter I had with the Lord, I've heard different things along the way and and for other people, obviously, but the last major encounter I had with him that where I was wrecked, bawling in my car with the word coming in, downloading it like in real time in the jumping world parking lot (laughs) was October 25th. Like I can tell you the date because then I put put weight on the word that he gave me. And I don't need another prophetic word because I'm still living out the word that he gave me. And if you're like, I don't hear the voice of the Lord and I want a word and you're coming on Wednesdays to Supernatural hoping for a word, but I want to ask you, what was the last thing he said? Because he's not in a hurry, right? He's not bound by space and time. He's He's the God of the universe. 
And he doesn't really care about what you do in which year and all the things that the world says is important to achieve the American dream. Like he wants you to become something that you will become for all of eternity. It's about becoming. It's not about earning and achieving and the materialism and the things that will fade away. It's about who we will become. One of the biggest fears that I had um, recently, Jeff heard from the Lord in January of last year. We had COVID. Uh, Autumn, our little nine-month-old, was on a heart rate monitor. She was on a steroid that caused her heart to drop. We had been in the ER the night before. I'm exhausted, right? And um, I come out to the living room, and he's like, I heard from the Lord. And I'm like, great. What did he say? And he's like, I think we're supposed to have another baby. And I was like, try again. Go back, go back. <laughs> He's like, no, no, actually he had this whole, he actually gave me a really long explanation of Ezekiel 4 and I'm Zechariah. like Zechariah 4 and I'm like with, you know, COVID and the baby and the things and he's like in the lamp stands and the olive trees and I'm like, wow, land the plane. What was the, what was the interpretation of all that? And he's like, no, we're supposed to have another baby. And I, and I was like, I, I, I know that sounds crazy, right? Cause I'm the one pushing for the reversal. And, but like I had her, here she is autumn rain. And I'm like, we're good. I'm good. Um, because that pregnancy was so hard guys. Like those of you that are my friends, you saw me come into the Kevin Leo conference in a wheelchair. Like I couldn't walk for 14 weeks. I had pressure and pelvic pain that was like debilitating 20 seconds into standing. I couldn't breathe. Like it was rough and it would kind of ebb and flow, but it was scary. She, and she rolled around in a chair, an office chair in yeah. the house that whole time. <laughs> and the kids would say, we play video games because we, we could hear you coming down the hallway and we'd turn them off before you got there. <laughs> Yeah, little punks. Anyway, so um, it was rough. And so when the Lord speaks about, I, I honestly, this is what played through my head. When the Lord says, no, I've called you, you have six lampstands. It's really a beautiful picture in Zechariah 4 about two olive trees. And all of the oil that comes from those trees comes into a lampstand and provides the oil or to a bowl, a golden bowl. And that bowl provides the oil for seven lampstands to shine. And so he said, you two are the olive trees. He calls them in later in that chapter, his anointed ones. But you have six lampstands and I've called you to have seven. And we had six children. And so we knew that the seventh was a child. And I said, can the lampstand be adopted? <laughs> and he said, I don't know, take it to the Lord. So I was like, oh, I'm not trying to sign up for another pregnancy. And I remember going to the Lord and saying, what are people going to think? Like they saw me struggle. This looks irresponsible at this point. Like, what if, and, da, 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 and I was going through all the things in my head. And the Lord said, whose opinion do you care most about? And he has told me over and over, like when it's hard to get to church, when I'm home with sick babies, when I struggle with what people think, and do they think I'm doing a good job? And do they think, and do they think? And he's like, you live for an audience of one. And if it's either get to church and hustle and bustle and do the things in your flesh or be home and worship with your girls on the floor. And then when, when you do get there, give what, you've get, what you have to give away from the time with me. That's what's important. And I remember thinking, he, it was so clear in my spirit that he had a life that was to come through us. Her name is Olive Joanne. She is the sweetest baby he told me when I was seven weeks pregnant with her, this child will teach you about my peace. We didn't know she was a girl. We didn't know we would name her Olive, the peacemaker. <laughs> she looks like me. She has his personality. The other one looks like him, has my personality. <laughs> um, but honestly, when the Lord speaks to something, then it'll sustain you. So that whole pregnancy, I thought, you would not call me to a pregnancy where I could not take care of the child you already gave me. And I began to press in for his promise and that he is the redeemer and he has redeemed my life from the pit before. So he would redeem this pregnancy. It was the most beautiful, easiest pregnancy I've ever had. I've naturally carried five children. I delivered her naturally after a C-section. Like everything about that pregnancy was redemptive. And when the enemy would come for my peace, I would say, no, no, no. I have a life inside of me that is incubating peace. 
that is teaching me how to carry his peace. I'm carrying it through her presence and her spirit. And she's still teaching me today. Our life is, has been chaos, like pure chaos. Whatever you think coming into ministry would look like, take that put it into a ball and throw it in the trash can because it has not looked anything like we thought it would, even though I felt like we were pretty prepared. We have had financial struggles. We have given up $120,000 in income, 171 if you count my teacher salary. We've you know, had persecution bigger than we've ever faced. We had a judge look at him and say, you have maliciously, intentionally underemployed yourself to evade child support. That's what was interpreted by his move here. She said, and I quote, no one leaves that much money on the table. No one. So now we're paying child support on his potential income, not his actual income. I spent all of Friday morning at the WIC office because we qualify. And processing, God, make me thankful that this is a provision of your hand. That I wouldn't live in, the, in a stigma because, see, I've been a missionary my whole life. There's nothing in me that's judgmental or unkind or thinks anything negative about someone that needs assistance. I just have never had to walk that road. And the Lord is saying, what if I want to bless you through this? Not through a check. Not, it's a season, right? He's told us it's temporary, but there's something to needing him to show up. And saying, if I would go to a hut in Africa for you, but I can't stay in America and get assistance when we need help to get cans of flour. I'm answering questions like, do you want to be on this plan where you get two pounds of cheese or this plan with one pound of cheese, but a voucher for formula? And da -da, you know what I mean? And I was just in a haze like, what? What is happening right now? <laughs> like we just left a, you know, we just left this paycheck that was so comfortable. But if the Lord's not in it, I don't want to be either. I want to go where he goes. You know why? Because there's grace there. There's mercy there. There's goodness there. There's faithfulness there. We can be comfortable and not have peace. We could, we, we could have a phone call that brings us to our knees and have to mourn the way that the world mourns, but we don't have to, right? Because he has called us to something through relationship and through lordship where I would rather take any path that he's called us to because his grace will meet us there. In a, in a conversation about this at the team leader meeting, one of our eld elders, Nikki, um, said this, and it was impactful for me and several of us in there. Um, when we brought up the subject of having to, and the reason we qualify is because we have seven kids, right? If it was just me and her and one or two, we wouldn't. But because there's so many, we qualify. So we brought up the idea of, um, and I said, is it a poverty mentality to pursue this? Because, uh, you know, I, we just came from a lot. Like we had a lot of money before, so is it poverty? And she said, no. She said, the Lord sent a raven to give Elijah bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And this is God sending a raven. So it was impactful for me and several of us in that meeting to hear that God will use even unclean things to provide for his kids. I'm not saying that Wick and that is unclean, but it's just different than what we're used to. Yeah, and he, he spoke to me about, from Psalms 37.3, it says, to trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. And so this has been a season of like, this is foreign to us, guys, like just the seven children coming into ministry, him being full-time ministry, um, the financial changes and, and things happening with that. We've had sickness at our home. Our two-year-old Autumn Rain got so sick with some kind of virus, we ended up rushing her to the emergency room three weeks ago. She had to get IVs. She, it, her veins you know, were dry and one blue. And um, he told me later, I, I've been a, a registered nurse. I'm still a registered nurse. I don't know when it expires next year sometime or something, but um, I told her, uh, and I'm not, I won't, I won't take the kids to the ER unless they're literally dying. Or she tells me, I'm going, if you want to come, you can come with me. That's the only time our kids have ever gone to the ER. But this time I went to her and I said, we need to go. 
And I didn't want to, I didn't want to scare her because you mamas can get scared when they hear things like this. But I said she was probably four to six hours away from a, from a hypovolemic crisis um, because she was so sick and she had to get two, two boluses of IV fluids. She had to get some dextrose put in there and um, she responded really well, but you know, they, they wanted her to drink some fluid. I'm just going to tell you a little bit. It was funny. They wanted her to drink some fluid, but she wouldn't, but she loves fruit juice. And so we asked the doctor, can she have some fruit juice? And they said, yes. So we said, if we give you fruit juice, will you drink water? And she said, yes. So she ate the fruit juice, drank a bunch of water and we could go home. Yeah, but, you know, in that moment, you're looking at this little baby that you love. She's, she's petite to begin with, and she just didn't have any reserves. She lost all of her color. Um, she was in the bath, like, slumped. Like, she loves bath time. She's always, like, 90 miles an hour, never stops, never stops talking, you know, and just to see her deflated. And um, then when he told me the severity of it later, like, it was, it was hard to not let fear creep into that. Like, oh, my gosh, she – don't Google that, by the way. Don't Google. No. Like, don't Google what that was. But this like crisis or this shock moment of like all of her blood restricting into her vital organs because her capillary bed refill was sluggish and all the things. And, um, you know, the way we handle moments like that is we go back to what he said. And I have from her baby shower in March, March 14th of 2020, every word spoken over my autumn rain. And I began to declare and to let it play over us what the Lord has said about her because most of those things she hasn't done yet at two years old. And so I'm saying, Lord, you said she had the call of Moses on her life. You said that she would set the captives free. You said that she would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, that she would live and not die. We speak life. We declare life over her. We cancel the assignment of the enemy. See, because the Lord is waiting for us to partner with him right? Like there are times he's been my rescuer. There are times he's delivered me and I did nothing. But there are times where he's saying, you teach your daughter to stand on what I've said because the world and everything around her and the other six children are going to have things vying for their attention, their identity, and their peace. And they better know what I've said. They better know what I'm saying. And everything that you do, whether you're a natural mother now or a natural father, or you're a spiritual mother or you're a spiritual father, or you will be one day, you can only give away what you have. And the greatest thing that you can give away to anyone you come in contact with is a history with God. It's not a platform because that's not duplicatable. It's not a title. It's not a microphone. It's not prestige. It's not any of that. It's you have a history with God. Let me help you see his faithfulness that got you here. He has been faithful when you weren't. He has loved you when you had other lovers. And he will carry you and he has a purpose and a, and a design calling. But I promise you that calling on your life is greater than you think it is. And it's greater than maybe you can even fulfill in your lifetime. So you got to partner with him and see the roots of your legacy and know that I'm going to do my part. I'm going to run my race. The Bible says run the race as if to win it. How many of us are running for first place? Not in competition, Not in competition, but for an audience of one. I'm going to run this race. I'm going to trust you that you're going to strengthen the muscles in my limbs. Give me air in my lungs to do this well. And I promise you, if you're really doing it, I'm pretty confident of this. It's going to make the idea of it will be scary. It will terrify you. It will be bigger than you can even imagine right? We all read that verse, like he can do abundantly more, all that you can ask or think, but that abundantly more is like jumping out of a plane, not knowing when your parachute's going to open. It's like being shot out of a cannon and not knowing where you're going to land. But you know what? There's a biblical precedent for it. Abraham in Genesis 12, the Lord said, get your family up. I know you're settled. I know you're comfortable, but get your family up where your daddy was rooted and your granddaddy was rooted and I want you to go to where I tell you to go. And I bet Sarah, Sarai at the time was like, where are we going, Abraham? (laughs) Where are we headed? What's the destination? What do they have there? (laughs) Do they have a cheesecake factory? (laughs) I mean, I'm sure she was. Like, 
Are they established? Are we going to have? And he was like, just go. So I know this looks crazy, right? We left a lot of money. We were having our seventh child. We had to both hear from the Lord. He heard from the Lord before I did. I was trying not to pray about it because I thought if I don't pray about it, then I can extend <laughs> this paycheck a little bit. <laughs> I'm just not going to take it to the Lord, but I had to, obviously, because he was like moving and he kept talking to PD and I was like, oh God, I got to hear from the Lord. <laughs> so <laughs> we're having a seventh kid, guys. So um, I remember saying to the Lord, I want to hear your voice. I got to hear it for myself. Because if he convinces me to do it, I'll resent him for it. He wants to take some big faith move and leave his job at the hospital like, that's one thing. But remember, I, had, I, had, I have history. I have a, a dad who was a minister. I had been a pastor's wife. I probably had some PTSD from some ministry stuff. I did not create a fairy tale in my head of being a pastor's wife. In fact, the day that it hit me, I was just manifesting all over the place for like 28 hours straight. Straight. Like Jeff would be like, he shouldn't say anything in 30 minutes. Nope, we're still here. I'm still here. Because I knew it was going to be hard. I knew, oh, right. So I'm going to get seven kids ready for church and you're already going to be there. I'm going to be sweating every time I get there from just trying to get these kids to get in the car. Like Levi wants to wear his pajama pants, like, you know, all the things. I knew, I knew that he was going to, if anyone had to stay home, it would be me. If, and I was like, I'm just coming into this ministry thing. I had all these dreams and hopes for the women and I just couldn't see how it was all going to pan out. And the Lord was like, it's not you. It's not going to be you. It's not supposed to be about you. It's about me. And people need to see how I want to do it through your family. So that they see, okay, wait, even if I don't have a title, even if I'm still in the marketplace, even if it looks like this, God can use me. And I can be right where I'm supposed to be in my lane running full speed ahead. And that's what's important. And so I, I want to share what the Lord spoke to me because I think it matters here. And it was on Monday morning at 10 a.m. I was in that last little phase of nesting, right? I, had a, I was having a baby in 10 days from this day. And Autumn's in the car. We're driving down Flower Bluff Drive. And I had reminded the Lord that morning, remember, I've got to hear from you on this thing. Um, speak to my spirit. I need a word. I need a phrase. I need a picture or something. And I'm driving. And the Lord said, wet the wood. Wet the wood. And if you've read that story in 1 Kings, in the Old Testament, it's the prophet right? It's the prophet Elijah, who I love. I named my first son Elijah. And um, I knew the story well. And in that story, you have Elijah who believes in the God of Israel. And he's worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you have 450 prophets worshiping the gods of Baal. And so it's a matter of who are we going to believe? And Jeff actually heard from this exact chapter months before. Yeah, she... When she came to tell me this, um, I said, man, that's crazy because the exact same chapter, maybe, I don't know, five verses before that is what the Lord used for me, the final for me. Because I, I was driving home from work one day and I said, Lord, don't you understand what my benefits are at the hospital, my retirement, my insurance, like, and, and he, you know, and he's probably chuckles to himself like, oh, here we go. And uh, I went to read my Bible and and I, I it was just one of those moments where I was kind of reading through previously. So I didn't even know where I read electronically on my iPad. And it just happened that the page I was on, I start reading and it's and it's first Kings chapter 18, verse 21. And it says, Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if, if Baal is God, follow him. And I was like, that's pretty clear. I, I, um, and the fear of God really is what, what f makes, makes you funnel from a wide space into a thin space and be squeezed through there because you know that you know that God is telling me to do this. 
And I don't know, I'm sure I could not do it and he'd still love me, I'd still be his son, but I don't want to take the chance of what that would look like if I'm not doing what he's asked me to do. Yeah, and I think when we live lives that we're not intended to live, um, I know there's grace, there's salvation still available, right? Like all of those things, but how many of you have something in you that like just so desires to live the life you were called to live that was written in your book? To be able to read through Psalms and know there was a book written about me and I want my life to actually line up with the pages in that thing right? Like when that's a desire of your heart, then you don't want to miss it. You don't want to just like skate into heaven and be like, I made it. I believed in you. We talked that one time and we were good and we're, here I am. Like, I want to know him. I want to know him. I want him to know me. I want eternity when I take that last breath to just be a continuation of fellowship, not a tear because, oh my gosh, I missed it all. I missed what I had access to heaven on earth. I could have had access to your peace and I lived without it. I lived anxious. I lived with crippling anxiety. I lived with sickness because I didn't know that you had bought my healing on the cross, that you paid for it with your stripes. I didn't live in the fullness. Guys, I don't want to leave anything that the cross provided on the table. I died for that. He's saying, I died for that. That thing you're struggling with, I died for that. I took lashes for that. I took the crown for that. It's not to condemn you. It's to say, I love you so much that I saw it. I gave it to you. I gave you access before you ever needed it. And now we get to walk in relationship. Guys, the world is making Christianity this religious thing. Do you know Jesus hated the religious? That they were the brood of vipers? That they were the snakes, they were the pigs, they were the dogs. We're not here for some man-made religion of rules. It said he never wanted the sacrifice of the blood of animals. He wanted our hearts. He wanted our yes. He wanted us to lay it all down and go, I know, like we didn't get fired, like we left it. I'm like, how in the world? I just sit around some days and I have to, I told Don, I can't look to the right or to the left. I can't look up or down. I can't look to northeast, northwest. I can't look anywhere because if I don't fix my eyes on Jesus, this was the dumbest thing we've ever done or it was the greatest move of faith that he's prepared us for our whole lives. <laughs> Giving away the car, it, it tested me right? Quitting my job, it tested me. Reversing the vasectomy, it tested me all for the moment that we're living in now to forsake all. And when he said, wet the wood, I began to sob because I knew what it meant. It meant, like Elijah, when they were going to call down fire, he said, you prophets, call, have your God call down fire. And they tried. And they tried, and they screamed, and they cut themselves, and they, they had this demonstrative, you know, just display of desperation, like, make it happen. And he said, maybe he's busy. Maybe your gods are going to the restroom. <laughs> like, he literally was sarcastic and said, "Where? I guess your gods are busy, but let me show you what my God will do. And he wet the wood over and over. He wet wood, which can't light fire. He, he put water in the trenches so that even those caught fire. And when he called it down, it proved that God is who he said he was. And so the Lord spoke to me in that jumping world parking lot. I'm crying. Autumn's like, oh no, mama. Oh no, mama. I'm like, it's okay. It's okay. I'm fine. And I just began to type out what the Lord was saying. I've never edited it. I never even shared it with him the other day. I read it to him and he was like, that's what book was that from? And I said, no, I wrote that. No, when you're talking to your wife and you're barely paying attention, you know, right. and you're like, you hear something and then you go. <laughs> He's like, yeah, what book? I'm like, I told you. I wrote this. I, she read it, and it caught my attention, and I went, what book is that from? And she was like, it's not a book. I wrote it. I told you that. But I do want to share it because I think it will inspire you. I think it will give you hope. It definitely did to me. And so when these things have come against us, like when the verdict in this Zoom court where we thought God is going to prevail and justice and the truth and the da-da-da, and it didn't look like we thought it would. And someone looked at this man and said, you should have thought about your children. You're going to think about them now. You quit your job and a quality of life they were used to having at Driscoll Children's Hospital for a passion of yours. 
and I see him choke back tears and say, it's not a passion, it's a calling. I know it doesn't make sense to give up that kind of money, but we trust God. So guess what? We're trusting God to provide it. Because you know what? Driscoll's no longer in the picture, but God hasn't gone anywhere. And either Driscoll Children's Hospital was my provider and all my faith in Christian blah, blah, blah was in that, or it's in the Lord who I haven't lost access to. Which is it? Either he is or he's not. Guys, either he did the things that we're teaching our children on worksheets that he did or he didn't. Either Jonah was in the belly of a whale or he wasn't. Either three survived the fire when it was turned up seven times hotter or they didn't. God, this is the God we say we believe. And we got Christians going, mm, are you sure you heard from the Lord? You have seven children. I don't know. That doesn't seem wise. Nothing seemed wise to the heroes of the faith. Nothing seemed smart. Noah looked like an idiot. But you know what? They weren't idiots and they weren't insane. They were hearing the voice of their father and they were being led step for step. And in the day and age that we're headed into, if you look to the right or to the left, if you look up or you look down, you will be led astray. You will become apathetic. Your heart will turn cold. It will get too hard. You will be tired of how they're construing the narrative. You will be tired of how you're portrayed and you'll just back off. I told him the other day, just get your job back. Like I, <laughs> it was so hard. I mean, obviously I was being sarcastic, but I was like, if that would just solve everything. I mean, it has been, I told him, what in the actual hell is happening in our lives? Because that's all I could see and I can't look at it. Because Joseph couldn't look at it. Because Moses couldn't look at it. Because Esther couldn't look at it. Because Daniel couldn't look at the lions that had been starved and hadn't eaten when he was in the den. This is why it matters. Because their lives are still speaking. Our cloud of witnesses is saying, you can do it. Hold on, girl. You got this. Hold on. Hold on. I'm in it. I know it doesn't look good. It doesn't mean that you missed me. You obeyed and I'm in it. So the Lord on that day said this. This is what came to my spirit. I wrote, when I need to hear what the Lord is saying right now, and I can't hear the distinguishable words in my spirit, I go back to his nature. I go back to the biblical patterns in his dealings with mighty men and women of faith. I go back to what he said since his word never changes. Here's what I know about his nature concerning people with influence, ones who left incredible legacies of promise and hope. He asked for big faith, not just bold or reckless faith. He asked for impossible faith. He didn't just tell Ezekiel to raise sleeping men. He commanded dry bones to live. He didn't tell Elijah to just call down fire. He said, wet the wood. I think because for those of us who want crazy influence, lives lived with meaning and legacy dripping from them, he knows our human condition. He knows as others compare their lives to ours, he has to remove the possibility of human reasoning, human justification. He has to remove all doubt that there could be any other explanation than him. So that unbelieving bystanders would look at the circumstance and say, there must be a supernatural God at work. If Abraham can place his son on the altar, then I can lay this down. If Ezekiel can speak to dry bones, I can speak to my failing body. If men can get in the fiery furnace, if Daniel can pray out in the open and face hungry lions, if Paul can advance the gospel in prison chains, if Esther can save a nation, then I can dig deep to find the place in my heart I am afraid to let go of and sink or swim, win or lose, succeed or fail, find crazy, impossible faith. Guys, you need a model in front of you that inspires hope. If you look at your desert season when the Lord is stripping and pruning and get your eyes on someone in their harvest season, you'll fail. That's not your model. Right now we're losing everything, but we have friends that are, that are in their harvest season, right? We're losing stability. We're losing security. We're losing the way we've always done things and a method of things. But you know whose model I look to? I look to Doug and Don. I look to people who forsake it all, who gave up six figures too. They're my model because the hope is in that model. It's easy to look at someone else and go, gosh, must be nice. Gosh, I wish I had that. And God has not been faithful. That will be the lie. That he has not been faithful to you. 
But what is the Lord saying now? What is he doing? Who are you to become? What is he molding in the potter, in the potter's clay? Is he adding water? Is he molding you in a certain way that's going to produce something eternal? Because that's what matters. Your hope is in him. Your hope is in his good nature. Your hope is in his faithfulness and the kindness that he's shown to you. And I don't know about you, but I can't look at a single time where he left me. I can't look back at a single time I thought I was going to die or the circumstance was going to overtake me, and it did. So if he's been faithful up until this point, he will be faithful still. So what we'll do now is we're going to transition into some time of ministry. Um, I'm going to, I'd like to ask the prayer partners to come on up. And um, I, I know that this message is, is hitting people in this room and something inside of you is growing. Something inside of you is being birthed or being watered. And as we were preparing this, I said to her, people need hope. That's just what the Lord kept telling me. People need hope. There's a scripture in, in Romans where Paul says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Suffering is synonymous with tribulation, trials. Perseverance is endurance. So suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces hope. So today, we're going to we're going to have some ministry time. I'm going to pray you out in a second. But if, if this message is really touching you and you need hope, you feel like you've, you've experienced suffering, you've experienced endurance, you feel like it's changing who you are, whether good or bad, you need to get prayer today. If you could, if everyone could just stand, please. There's a scripture um, that says we've, we fellowship with him in the power of his resurrection, comma. We fellowship with him in suffering. It all is ignited by death and being resurrected with him. So if you feel like this trial, tribulation, suffering, the endurance that you've put into this is not producing character or hope. And let's ask the Lord to come in and crucify what he needs to crucify and resurrect what he needs to resurrect. So at this time, I'd like to ask you to come up and I'm going to go ahead and pray over you guys and dismiss you. If you have if you need to have conversations and those types of things, please take those out into the lobby. We want this to be a, a special moment with the Lord because he loves you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your body. Thank you for your people. Thank you for your beloved. God, they're here this morning and online. And they need hope. They need something inside them to rise up. Something inside them to be inspired, God. And we know that only comes from you. It only comes from time with you. Not from TV, social media, it comes from you, Lord. So God, this morning, I ask that you would come and touch every heart. 
touch every soul, every person in this room, Lord. Show us the truth. Give us hope. Show us what it means to be your beloved, to be your child. The God of all creation sacrificed the most important thing to him for you and all of your stuff. And he knows the beginning from the end. So nothing you're going through caught God off guard. He's already seen the provision down the road, even if you don't see it. He's already provided it. And I promise you, he'll provide lots of chances, lots of opportunities, lots of side roads to, for you to get where he wants you to go. Nothing is too far gone. So today, Lord, we praise you. We honor you. We thank you for the hope that you have set before us. We shoot for the prize. We run the race. We accept the challenge. And we obey your direction. Father, I thank you for this body, this church. And everyone, as they travel home, as they travel to lunch or wherever they go, I just ask that you would be with them, cover them with peace, protect them as they drive, protect their families, bless them financially, heal their bodies, Lord. We praise you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen.